The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. is a state of beauty and wonder. A hundred million women are missing, claimed the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen. He demonstrates that the world contains a hundred million fewer women than there, at present than there would be if human rights prevailed for all. In his Nobel banquet speech, Amartya Sen praised freedom of the mind and quoting Tagore said, Freedom of the mind comes when, and I quote Tagore, the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit. Peace must insist on freedom of expression and thought. We need all these different ways to have peace in the world, but peace is not possible for those whose human dignity has been removed due to their lack of financial resources. And that is why Muhammad Yunus, a revolutionary, an economist, a banker, was acknowledged by the Nobel Committee in 2006 for his work in creating peace. Professor Muhammad Yunus developed a determination as a child to eliminate poverty when he saw his mother, Sophia Khatun, help every poor person who knocked on their door. After completing his doctorate in economics at Vanderbilt University, where he was greatly moved by the US civil rights movement, he returned to academic life in Bangladesh. His teaching of, as he puts it, elegant theories of economics seemed out of place as he bumped into the far too many people who desperately needed small sums of money to preserve their bodies, their souls, and their dignity. In the 1970s, while chair of the Department of Economics at Chittagong University, Muhammad Yunus decided to lend small amounts of money to poor people, particularly women, so that they could purchase materials such as bamboo in order to make and then sell stools and similar goods. He did not know them, they had no collateral. That $27 of loans was paid bank, and thus began the Grameen Bank, a village bank a bank that became a lifelong imperative for Muhammad Yunus. In 1983, Grameen was established by Yunus against the advice of conventional bankers and government officials. It is, unlike most banks, founded on principles of trust and solidarity. It works on the assumption that human beings can be enormously creative if their situations permit. It looks for this creativity and determination in its clients, rather than seeking collateral and proven financial success. Grameen Bank offers very small loans to the poorest of the poor, known as microcredit. On average, one borrower receives loans in the region of $150 over a period of time. 94% of the borrowers of Grameen are women. 98% of its loans are paid back. Grameen has lent money to over 7 million women in Bangladesh, and microcredit has helped over 100 million women around the world in North America, Scandinavia, as well as in the Third World. Grameen was initiated by Muhammad Yunus, a compassionate banker. Muhammad Yunus firmly believes in the power of enlightened capitalism to eliminate poverty and is someone who continues to parlay his in innovative ideas into action. He has written that the only place for poverty ought to be in a museum of poverty, 
so that future generations will have to ask. So that future generations will have to ask, what was poverty like? And he continues to innovate. His recently published book, Creating a World Without Poverty, puts forward the notion of social business, a notion he will discuss with us tonight. Muhammad Yunus is simultaneously wise and humble. It is wonderful to see someone from Bangladesh coming to the United States to help us learn about finance and banking. <laughs> I couldn't resist that, not scripted by the way. <laughs> At his Nobel acceptance speech, he insisted that, and I quote, globalization must not become financial imperialism. It is this move away from ruthless power, this love for beauty and wonder, this desire to ensure freedom of mind and thought, and this determination from a compassionate banker that ensures we understand the urgency of his work. Thank you, Muhammad Yunus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm so delighted to be here this evening. And what a beautiful introduction. Someone coming from Bangladesh to bring finance and banking instructions. <laughs> And I have been complaining, that's why she said that. <laughs> I was complaining that uh, such a sophisticated state-of-the-art banking system in this country, and still millions of people in this country can't open a bank account because they are too small and banks will not let them have bank account. And it's still payday loans go around because you can't find a small loan to cope with little need between your salary checks. So you go to payday loans to pay 50%, 60% interest. And pawn shops flourish everywhere. So there's something not right about the financial system, not only in the United States, globally. Today, if you look at the financial system, almost two-thirds of the world population are not considered eligible to do business with the conventional financial institutions. We can't feel too comfortable with a system, with an institutional arrangement like that. In a world where you need a dollar to catch a dollar, there's nobody for these two-thirds of the world population to give the first dollar in your hand so that you can catch the next dollar and next dollar and next dollar and move on. And this I did not realize in the sense, in the way that I'm describing now until I sort of bumped into a situation. I never planned to become a banker. That's not, that's not the kind of plan I ever had in my mind. As a young person, as you grow up, like every other child, you plan to become the firefighter, you want to become the policeman, you want to become the pilot or something. So I have gone through that part too, but never to become a banker. <laughs> now when people say, ah, we introduce a banker, a passionate banker, I said, am I a banker? 
And I see people say, ah, a banker got a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and looking at that, of such a prestigious thing to receive a Nobel Prize, and I find it so easy, in my case, to have it. All I have to do, just do everything the way opposite to the bankers do. Isn't that fun? <laughs> and you, you see what we did, literally we did the, uh, just reversing everything conventional banks do. The basic principle of conventional banks is that the more you have, the more you can get. So they are always looking for people who have a lot so that they can give them or so that they can get more. So we looked at that and we reversed it. We said less you have, the higher priority you get. If you have absolutely nothing, you get the highest priority. And we became back Grameen Bank. Conventional banks want you to bring collateral. Without collateral, they cannot give you any money. So that you have, they have to have something against which they will give you something. We said, since we are, our priority is to reach out to people who have nothing, so this principle will not work. So we said, we don't need any collateral. So we just discarded the whole idea of collateral. When we tried to do that, everybody said, you can't do that because people will not pay back. I said, we'll try, find out whether they do or not. Why prejudge everything? So we dismissed that idea of collateral. And along with goes the guarantee. We don't need anybody's guarantee. Who is this poor person find a guarantee to support her? So we said, no guarantee, no call at all. Then what we did, we said, no lawyers. <laughs> no lawyers, no guarantee, no call at all. And that's what Grameen Bank is. Isn't it easy to get a Nobel Prize? <laughs> you get them all out <laughs> and you make it. And conventional banks go to the rich, we go to the poor. They go to men, we go to the women. They go to the cities, we go to the villages. So again, reversing everything. In a conventional bank, if you want to borrow money, I don't know how many of you have experience of borrowing money from a bank. They would expect you to know everything about your business for which you are borrowing money. You are an expert in that business. When we go to the women, poor women in the village of Bangladesh, trying to explain to her what we do, how we lend money. After we explain everything, she looks at us very innocently. She says, no, I don't need any money. Then if we explain to her further, try to attract her into that proposition, she says, no, I never handled money in my life. Some would even say, I never touched money in my life. And out of desperation, she will say, why don't you go and talk to my husband? He's the one who handles money. I never handled money. I don't know anything about money. We train our staff saying that if a woman reacts like that, responds like that, that I don't know anything, I never handled money, give the money to my husband, we tell them, she's the one we are looking for. <laughs> so it's again another reverse. 
They want you to be an expert. We try to pursue someone who had never done anything in her life in terms of handling money. Our explanation is poor people, since they never had experience, have to make a start. So how can we expect them already be in business and then we come and do that? Then they'll never be, in, we can never find one. So that's how we do it. And in our bank, our basic principle is people should not come to the bank. Banks should go to the people. At right at this time, Grameen Bank has seven and a half million borrowers. Ninety-seven percent of them are women. We have 27,000 staff. And our loans are paid back in weekly installments. So our staff, 27,000 staff, they go out every day to meet these borrowers to do their business at the doorstep of our borrowers. Within five working days in a week, they meet all the seven and a half million borrowers face to face at their doorstep to bring the banking service to their doorstep. That's what the Grameen Bank is. Unlike the conventional banks where they want you to come to their office. So what I was trying to explain that what we did in a way is the reversal completely turning it around. In earlier days, in one of his seminars, one agitated banker, when I was explaining all this, one agitated banker in Bangladesh stood up, he said, Professor Yunus, you put the banking, banking system upside down, meaning that I made a mess of it. I said, yes, I have done that because the banking system was it, standing on its head. <laughs> so that's how I looked at it and I put it on its feet. It works. Now it came out more forcefully, I can explain that, with the subprime crisis. Report. Journalists ask me often, right now, how do you lend money to those people who don't have any collateral, any background information, nothing? I said, we do it on trust. I said, to look at the banks now with the subprime loan, the port, what a disaster it is because it was a high-risk sector, segment of market they went in. I said, if you call subprime as a high-risk segment of market, what would you call the people that we lend money to? Sub, 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 subprime, something? <laughs> and wherever we are, we don't feel our business risky because we feel very comfortable. Because wherever Grameen Bank or microcredit went globally, nobody ever said they had problem in getting their money back because our repayment has always been near 100%, 98, 99%. So it only says that if there is a crisis in the subprime, it's not because there are something wrong with the people. All we can say, the banks who did that didn't know how to do the business. So we need to address this issue, what the financial system should look like. Not only we give loans for income generating activity so that they can move out of poverty, and they do consistently borrowers of Grameen Bank, step by step, move out, move out of poverty. Grameen Bank is different again another way from the conventional banks. We, 
we all along insisted, encouraged and campaigned to send the children to school. And in, at a very early stage of our work, we succeeded. We sent all our children to school. And we felt good that they went to school. Then we noticed many of these young children, the little boy, little girl, not only they went to school, they start being on the top of the class. We got the thrill of our life coming from the literate families for the first time going to school, you'd expect them to be on the back bench. Now they're in the top of the class. So we wanted to celebrate that. So one way we came out of celebration, we started giving them scholarships as a recognition of the performances they're making. Last year we gave 51,000 students scholarships. So it's, it's a bank which not only worries about its money, whether money is coming back, whether they're making profit. It's a bank which worries about their children. What is their performance to build up the initiative and encouragement among the children? And not only they went to school, not to, we found out some 15 years back, some of them started getting into the colleges few of them in the universities. Then we got another kick out of it. We have never, never thought children from these illiterate families, when I say illiterate families, this is not the first illiterate families, it's the generations and generations of illiterate families coming to that level. For the first time coming to school, not for going into finishing their primary school, but they're getting into the university without any support from anybody else. Suddenly we realized that many probably have missed the opportunity because nobody supported them. So we said, we can't let it happen. So we introduced the student loan right away. We guaranteed them anybody who can enter into higher education. Entire financing will, done be, will be done by Grameen Bank. Tuition, maintenance, books, computers, whatever you need. Right now, there are more than 21,000 students in medical schools, engineering schools, universities with the Grameen Bank student loans. <laughs> and some of them already have their PhDs. In this trip, I was traveling from Washington, D.C. to Austin and Houston and came here. In Austin, I was in a gathering of Bangladeshi community there. They wanted to meet me and talk to me. And one young man came to me, said, I just wanted to shake hands with you and introduce myself. I said, go ahead. He said, my mother is one of the borrowers of Grameen Bank. I came all the way here, study in Austin. So it's an amazing experience, these illiterate families, all of them are illiterate families. Now the new generation, the second generation out of them, having education, and some of them very highly professionally trained people, going to the highest level of education. So the cycle of poverty, which has been perpetuating, stops here a new begin, a new life with a new generation. I always insisted that the credit is so important in people's lives so that you can build your own life. You be on the driver's seat of your own life because you have, every human being has unlimited potential no matter where she or he is born. Each human being has wonderful gift inside of him, inside of her. 
but society has never allowed millions and millions of them who could never had the opportunity to unwrap that gift to find out what he and she has. And she dies unexplored, unknown, unidentified. What a loss to herself and what a loss to human society. And another thing I insisted that information technology, the way it kind of blossomed suddenly, it has endless potential in changing the life of the poor people. If it can be appropriately designed to serve her. So one opportunity I got in Bangladesh and I took advantage of that opportunity. I applied along with many others to set up a cell phone company. We named our company as Grameen Phone. After long debates and discussions, finally among five other companies, we also got a license, Grameen Phone. We were explaining to the government official that if we get our license, what we intend to do, we want to bring the cell phone in the villages of Bangladesh and then give loans to Grameen Bank borrowers, the women, to buy herself a cell phone. And the government official says, what? You want to sell cell phone to the poor women? Who is she going to call? <laughs> I said, well, she may have other people to call, but the important thing is there are many people in the village who would like to make calls to other people so she can rent this telephone to them and make money. They thought it's a crazy idea, it will never work. Once we introduced it, the women loved it. <laughs> they never saw a telephone in their lives. They become expert on cell phones. <laughs> they start talking their telephone language, country code, area code, time of the day. <laughs> well, if you speak to her for five minutes, you'll be wondering whether she was born with a cell phone in her hand. <laughs> She's so confident with it. It became a roaring business. We started calling them telephone ladies and now telephone ladies are everywhere in Bangladesh <laughs> making money, selling cell phone services. Bangladesh doesn't have enough electricity. Seventy percent of the population of Bangladesh have no access to electricity. So when you bring cell phone in the villages, how do you charge the battery? We solved the problem right away. Solar panel. <laughs> so this was not a barrier. And Grameen Phone became the largest cell phone company in the country. And not only the largest cell phone company, I would say now it is the largest company in the country. So you can imagine what a s small idea can blossom into a big, idea, big business. And once we got into the solar, we created a solar company, we call it Grameen Shokti or Grameen Energy. All we wanted to do is to bring solar energy to the villages, village homes, sell them solar ho home system. Everybody said, no, you, people will never buy it. It's too expensive for people to afford it. Solar panel is too costly. We said, we'll try. We tried. And it worked. In the beginning, reaching a total of 100 solar home system, we thought it's an impossible target. Soon we achieved 100. Then we started selling 100 solar home system every month. Last year, by the middle of last year, we crossed the 100,000 solar home system in Bangladesh.
and our next target is to reach million solar home system in the next four years. So again, this was not an art shattering idea, solar panel was always there. All we came up with an idea that it can be done in a business way so that people can have lights in their house, they can, they can have, watch television in their house, their children can study at night, they can have a clean light. So looking at this, all these things that happened around us, we wonder what creates poverty? What is the cause of poverty? And every time we ask that question, our answer is poverty is not caused by poor people. They are not at fault. Poverty is caused by the system that we have built, institutions that we have created, policies that we pursue, even the concepts that we have, they created poverty. Poverty is an artificial imposition of human being. It's not natural to human being. So if you want to remove poverty, you want to go back to the system, redesign the system, redesign the institution. So look at the banking institution. Even after we have done it in Bangladesh for so many years and now it's being done all over the world, has the conventional banks changed their mind? No, no. So that's where we go wrong. Can anybody say now the poor people are not credit worthy? No way. Because they are more credit worthy than the people that conventional banks are lending money to. In Bangladesh, where the conventional banks lend money, the richest people, the richer you are, bigger loan defaulter you are. That's a kind of a given condition. So the poor people around the world showed without lawyers, without guarantees, without collateral, they continue to pay back. The trust works and they can change their life. One concept that I particularly focus in the book that I have just published is the concept of business. The, and the concept of business is based on an image of a human being which doesn't look like the real human being. Only business that is known in the economic theory is the business to make money. Profit maximization is the mission of business and that's what we all have around the world because that's what the economists told us. So the real human beings are imitating the human being created in the theory, which to me is quite insulting. It is the theory who should be imitating the real human being rather than the other way around. Real human beings are not money-making machines. Real human being is much bigger than money-making machines that other urges of human beings, other dimensions of human beings are not reflected in the economic theory. And that's where everything went wrong. My proposition in the book, in order to justify the totality of the human being, we must create at least one more category of business, along with the business that we know already. The one that we know already is the profit maximizing business. One that I'm proposing is a social business, business to do good to people. That can be a business too. In the profit maximizing business, everything is for me. I am the center of focus of everything because everything has to be. Social business where I delink myself everything for others.
it's a no, I define it by saying it's a non-loss, non-dividend company. <laughs> See? <laughs> non-loss, non-dividend company devoted to a social goal. And we can create such social businesses and I have created some of these social businesses. One became very popular now is the Grameen Danone company in Bangladesh. This is a joint venture between the Danone of France, which is a yogurt company and a water company, Avian Water. It's a huge big company. And Grameen, together we created a, a company which produces yogurt, the same Danone yogurt, famous globally, but for a different purpose. There are millions of malnourished children in Bangladesh. Poor people cannot afford to give the right kind of diet to their growing children, so they become malnourished. So all the micronutrients which are missing in the children, the vitamin, iron, zinc, and whatever else is missing, we put these micronutrients into that yogurt. So it's become a fortified yogurt and sell it at a very cheap price to the poor children who enjoy this delicious yogurt. Our idea is the more they will eat this yogurt, gradually they will regain their health. And it's a social business because Danone has agreed they will never take any dividend out of this company. They can take back their investment money, but nothing beyond that. Grameen has committed itself the same way, never take any dividend. They can take the investment money back all the profit stays with the company to achieve the goal that it has set. The goal is to see how many children are regaining their health. So the bottom line of a social business is different than the bottom line of a profit maximizing business. In profit maximizing business, your bottom line is what is the return on your investment? How much profit you made? In a social business, your bottom line is how many people you have reached with the social goal that you were pushed your, you put as your target. So these are the two different kinds. We can create many varieties of social businesses. For example, I mentioned in the book that 47 million Americans don't have health insurance because profit maximizing insurance companies don't consider them as a market to make money. So this would be a good case to bring a social business and cover every single American with health insurance. And you can go along with the idea that I started with by saying, Many millions of Americans don't have bank accounts. We can run social business where every American can open a bank account and cash their check because those people who don't have bank account cannot cash their check. So their salary check, even the government check, they have to take it to the check cashing companies and they get ripped off. And then the pawn shops, then the payday loans, these can be addressed as social business because this money making, profit making companies will not come around. The, if we can bring this idea into picture, a lot of other supportive thing has to be created. Like for example, if you want to find a social business where we, I want to put my thousand dollar as an investment into a social business which bring safe drinking water to the people who cannot find the safe drinking water around. Where do I go to find this company? Today there is no arrangement to bring the company and the investors together. Because the stock market which is supposed to do that, we have only one stock market today which is only about making money. 
So everybody goes there to make money. So I said, in order to do the other thing, to bring services to the people who need the services desperately, we need a social stock market. where all those companies will be listed who are bringing safe drinking water for the communities who don't afford to have drinking water, who bring microcredit to the people who don't have the banking opportunities, who bring healthcare services to the people who never receive any healthcare services and so on and so forth. So enormous varieties of possibilities. Once we can bring them together, then there will not be any poor person anywhere in the world. They will peel off their poverty because it doesn't belong to them. It doesn't belong to human society and everybody will be out and will create a world without poverty. And only place will see poverty in future will be the poverty museums. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to set a date when we build our poverty museum. And we have to set a date when Santa Barbara will have its first, for the first time, it will have its poverty museum. It's possible. It's not something crazy. All we need to do, find whether we have reached that point where there is nobody is a poor person in Santa Barbara. Then we run an ad in the newspaper. If you find one poor person in Santa Barbara, $10 million award. <laughs> and nobody is a taker because nobody can find one. Then you go and build the museum. And we can build a world like that and do it within our lifetime. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know a lot about banks, but I... Like me, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I think, though, that in the U.S., you, you have to have bank insurance, like the bank has to have its own insurance. And I have a friend who's a doctor who refuses to pay malpractice insurance because he thinks it's, you know, it's a crock and you basically end up uh, paying all this money for nothing. Um, so my question is, how in the U.S. can we start banks like this without having insurance, without having that kind of thing? Yeah, not only insurance, in, in the U.S., like in other countries, to, create, to set up a bank needs enormous amount of money. And that's what I complain about. I said, uh, we cannot create a microcredit bank. We don't have that kind of money to do it because we deal with a small amount of money. So why should we spend so much money to create that bank? So I said that existing banking law is like, a, 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 like an architecture of a super tanker. You have to have a huge thing, which is an ocean-going vehicle, uh, ocean-going vessel which carries a lot of cargo and so on. I said, microcredit bank is like a dinghy boat. <laughs> it goes into shallow water. It goes everywhere. But we cannot create that dinghy boat with the architecture of a super tanker. If we do it, it will drown. So we need a separate architecture. We need a separate legislation for it. That's what we have to argue with the lawmakers. Why don't you allow us to create a tiny little bank to serve the people who need tiny little money? Two thousand, five thousand, ten thousand dollars. That's all they need. They don't need millions of dollars. And that's what we have to do. Yeah. Sridhar, so I want to thank you for being here. Thank you. And uh, thank you for everything that you've done for the human society. Um, you mentioned the credit crisis here in the U.S. And you talked about how your bank operates basically on trust. Um, if your bank 
was operating here in the United States as an economist and a banker yourself, how would you operate given the fact that although we do have collateral, people are still defaulting? How would you operate here? If uh, we, already there are many microcredit programs in the United States. Uh, I was first invited to come from Bangladesh to start a micro, help start a microcredit program in Arkansas uh, when a guy called uh, Governor Bill Clinton was the governor of the state. He figured it out, he called, contacted me and uh, I came and helped him to set up a microcredit program in 1986. And ever since, there are many, many microcredit programs have been created. Um, so it's already why, here. And why is it that that works, but our conventional bank don't? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mohammed, will yeah. you take all four? Uh, yes. Professor Yunus will take all four on that side, and then the final one on that side, and those are the last questions. Okay. Hi. You said there is no profit in uh, social business, but then you talk about all these children who are going to school. Just, just a second. There is profit in social business, but profit for the company, not for the investor. But investor cannot take profit out of it. So yeah. maybe we can say that microcredit is a kind of micro-capitalism, uh, maybe. Uh, everything is capitalism, of course. We are in the free market situation. Uh, so it's a, it's a, I'm, what I'm suggesting, uh, in a way, in my book, I, s I said that it's a half-done capitalism. So I'm bringing it to its logical conclusion. If something is missing in, capital, in the capitalist theory, that social business is missing. If you put that piece in, it becomes a robust system. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. I'm not saying you close down profit-maximizing business. I'm not saying you close down uh, charities. I'm not saying anything. We're saying you do everything you do, but create this window, uh, door so that people who want to take that door can go through that door. That's all I'm saying. And it will make you stronger. All the problems that we have created around us can be addressed within the market system. Today, market cannot address this system or anything of that. So we say, let's dump it on the shoulder of the government. And we do. Government cannot handle those things either. So we are in a mess. So if you can bring it within the market system, we can resolve it because we citizens are creative people. We are more enterprising than the government. We are more creative than the government. Government is a slow machine. Government doesn't work very fast, no matter which government it is. By nature, it is very slow. So we are here. The citizens are here. Citizens can address all this problem much more efficiently. Any government can ever do that. Um, hi, I'm a loan officer here for a local nonprofit organization that started uh, microfinance based on your model. See, it's here. <laughs> so I wanted to say thank you. It's very good. First of all, and I have a question regarding the social business and nonprofit. As working at a nonprofit, I see them as being sort of the same thing, but I was wondering if you could maybe give me yeah, more concrete distinction between yeah. social business, nonprofit, because yeah. one of the issues that we're constantly facing is sustainability, getting yeah. grants and charitable kind of donations. You already explained what is a nonprofit. But, <laughs> but how, how, does, how do you move from being a nonprofit to a social business or how? Convert into a business. Can Become you? owners. Nonprofit doesn't have an owner. So it's basically elements of charity. You may recover some cost, may not. As a result, you are always going around finding money to run it, pay your salary, to do, let the program running. You always worry, we may not be able to raise enough money to keep all our four jobs that we have within, we have to cut one job because we are not getting money. Always worrying it, because whether people will give you money, some donation. So that's the non-profit or NGO world. I'm saying why don't you convert, if it's possible, not everything can be converted into a social business, but if this can be converted into social business, you don't have to worry about any other people because it runs by itself. You cover your cost. As long as you cover your cost, you can go on endlessly and continue to do whatever you're doing. So that is the robustness of social business. And I said it goes on ever and ever. 
but uh, not the same for uh, charity organizations or uh, non-profit organizations where, where you have to bring fresh money to keep it moving every day, every time. That's the difference. Okay. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for sharing all of your wisdom with us tonight. We all very much appreciate it. Um, my question actually refers to our banker friend who was up here earlier having the uh, social-based window versus the regular banker window at the, um, at the bank. Do you believe that there could be a transition between going from the for-profit, all-about-me mentality that is business these days to this social yeah. base? Or do you, believe that, do you believe that there's a transition that has to occur? What would that be? Or do you believe that these systems would be running parallel, creating competition between one another? I would, I would say the more, in, uh, it will, more likely that it will be parallel. Same person will be investing money to make money and also investing money to do good. Because this is in everybody's heart. People are not either angel, they are not either devil. They are people. They do all the kinds of things. And making money, is, there's nothing wrong with it. As long as it's a legitimate, we do it right, make money. And when I make money, I also want to do good. That option presently is not available. Only option is available is charity. So charity becomes a weak thing, inefficient thing. Not everything has to be done by charity. A lot of it can be done as a social business. Foundations which give billions of dollars each year can use part of that money as a social business. And if each year we had built more and more social businesses, imagine how many of these problems we could have addressed and how much we have learned along the way in addressing the problem. So I would say it's more parallel. They will compete with each other and continue and it will benefit both. Because profit maximizing companies will also know if we don't behave, some social business will start coming in and take us out of business. So Thank they have you. to behave right. Fabulous. Thank That's you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming again tonight. I'm a global studies major at UCSB, so your words are especially inspirational to me. Thank you. Um, my question is about microcredit and um, disaster relief. I know that Bangladesh has a lot of floods, and so in the past, microcredit, or I mean not microcredit, but Grameen has been able to help the poor people recover when everything is wiped out in a flood. So do you think that microcredit can be applied to disaster relief oh, worldwide? Very much, very yeah. much. Otherwise, microcredit will not be... Uh, operational in Bangladesh. It will disappear if it cannot <laughs> handle that. So we are the expert in handling disaster. That's why when the Katrina took place here in uh, New Orleans, everybody said, you learn from Bangladesh. They are the expert in this business. Uh, we handle it uh, in a way, uh, we let, let people get out of it as soon as possible. And still the bank doesn't get hurt. Still our repayment rate continues and so on and people are lifted away from the problems they have. So we have to create a completely uh, uh, a complete system to handle disaster situation. Like one, just quickly to put, the moment disaster takes place in one corner or one area of Bangladesh, Grameen Bank people know exactly what is to be done because the destructions are already there. You Im declare emergency in your area. And once you declare emergency in your area, all banking work stops. You convert yourself into a humanitarian organization. Your only job is to save people. Whatever money it takes, use the bank's money to save people. Don't wait for something will come from somebody will help. Don't wait for that because people cannot wait. So try and save people. Save. <laughs> Find safe place for them. If it is a flood, find dry place for them. Find doctors for them because a lot of people get hurt in the uh, disaster situation. So we have teams and teams of doctors and paramedics trying to treat people. It's all done by the coming bank because you are now, suddenly you are somebody else. Your job is to save people's life. And only after you have gone through that phase, the next phase is rehabilitation. Put them back on their feet again, whatever it takes. Only then we get back again to our life. So it's, it's an it's a integral part of the system. It's, you don't have to think. It's, it's, it immediately gets into action. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> Eleven years ago in Bangladesh, I walked into one of your banks, and Excellent. I thought this, this, uh, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And this Thank needs you. to spread, and I'm glad it has. 
So thank you for that. Thank you. I've also been thinking about how can this model come into America, places like Oakland, Los Angeles, and, and, and also, I, I'm just going to ask you, do you have any advice for how it could go into those areas and include men as well? Because sure. I, I understand the situation in Bangladesh. See, he has soft corner for men. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I understand the situation in Bangladesh yeah, and, the, and the reasons behind sure. it and so forth. I've read your book and, yeah. and, and I've studied it. But, yeah. but do you see or do you have any advice on how a model that would include young men sure. in those inner cities could also work? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, 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 we have been fighting with this issue for a long time. Uh, now we want to go in a bold way to resolve it. Uh, we have been uh, lobbying at the Congress to change the welfare law, to allow welfare people to get out and move on, because welfare law keeps the people there so that they cannot get out. Yeah? Mm -hmm. They are very protected. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we said it's a welfare law has been designed in a way you take the full-blooded human being, put it in a bottle and tight the screw so that they can never get out. I said, this is a shame. Welfare law should be something which will be encouraging people, taking people out of where the situation they are so that they can become full citizens, they become taxpayers rather than depend on the taxes. Uh, that's not the way it is done. So we are arguing with them, proposed lots of amendments to the welfare law so that uh, it can take place. And also changes in the legal framework for banking. Today we have created something called Grameen America. Which, will, uh, be, which has been discussing with the Federal Reserve System to give us a legal home so that we can function as a bank uh, without going through big bank license and so on. There are many other small bank facilities which we are seeing whether it can use those law or create a new law so that this kind of program can go on. Uh, and then address those issues of uh, uh, opening bank accounts, payday loans, pawn shops, and all the things that I'm mentioning, so that this can be even uh, addressed in a, in a specific location, so see it can be handled. And there are men, women of all kinds, uh, immigrants, all people who need facility uh, 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 to move on with their life. Mm -hmm. And now it's uh, just started operating in Jackson Heights in New York. That will be their first location, and then gradually they'll move into other locations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mohammed Yunus, 2006 Nobel Peace Prize laureate. same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing.